Hello, everyone. It's good to see everyone in person, uh, much better than uh, being online like it previously has for the, for the last meeting. So um, it's nice to see you all. So I'm Stephen Moore, and I am the project manager of the ORV3 rack, the next generation OCP rack, moving on from ORV2. I work for Rital. And um, I'm just going to run through some of the updates that we've recently made. Um, I'm going to focus on updates since the last presentation, so um, I'm not repeating myself. Um, but it, there's some, some good developments we've been making recently um, based on a lot of test feedback that we've been having entering into the EBT phase of this project. So some of the topics that I'm going to cover today, um, starting with the differences of features between ORV3 and ORV2. I think a lot of people here might be familiar with the new features now, but uh, just a reminder for anyone that is new to this product. Then I'm going to go into some of the, the rack testing and what, what, what's actually the testing that we're going through on the ORV3 rack. Um, and th this is fed into the spec from Facebook, Rital, and also the ATST standards from America. EVT rack developments, I'm just going to touch on the initial test developments that we've, we've recently been doing. Some rack improvements, which are just general improvements for usability of the rack. Cooling FEA, some of the cooling FEA that we've been doing for um, some of the cooling manifold manufacturers. Airflow management, um, which is very similar to V2 today, but we have to obviously have those same features in RV3. And then finally, some brace beam developments. Um, so one of the requirements of V3 is having that movable beam, so we'll go into some of the detail there. And then finally, just an overview of the test results that we've, we've had since making some of these updates. So here, it's just a very basic table just explaining the, the features that in comparison between ORV2 and ORV3. So first, the one at the top there is 48 volt buzz bar support, um, ORV3, which is um, the development of the buzz bar for that rack right now. And um, that's the path we're going down with that. Power shelves, um, one of the differences, V2, we had the fixed power shelf position because of the fixing points for the buzz bar. Um, but this now with the development of the blind mate power power clip connector, and um, we, we now have the ability to move that power shelf wherever in the rack. So that's part of the development. Single power zone, um, again, because of the fact that we can move that buzz, uh, power shelf wherever in the rack, we've now got a single power zone instead of the two split power zones in the rack. Toolless rack rails. So before we had um, obviously fastened rails in the rack, but now we've, we've introduced um, a clip design that allows the, the rails to be to be fitted very, very quickly and efficiently for um, data centers and, and integrators to, to take them in and out. So the, the, that tool design is brand new to ORV3. We also have RU gear support. So beforehand, obviously, it was only the OCP OU size support, but now we ha also have the RU support um, by a unique design in, in the vertical member. Um, we actually have a, an ORV3 rack at the Rital stand. So if you wanted to get familiar with any of these, these points that I'm raising here, you can always come to the stand and we can answer some of the questions um, and highlight some of these, these, these key features I'm listing out here. Another, th another thing there is the um, quantity of the gear that we can now store in ORV3. It's increased from 40 OU up to 44 OU, and obviously the addition of the, the RU there as well. Um, modular rack, so um, cabling, provide modular cabling solutions. So before on V2, um, we have the, the, the fixed position for the cable management at the front. Um, now we have a modular cable manager, which we can either remove or um, even update to a, a, a different kind of cable manager that can be fitted. Um, and this allows for uh, much more modularity um, when baying the racks, transferring cables from left to right. Um, beforehand, it was more difficult, whereas now with the modular cable manager we can remove, it's much more simple. Support of the optional rear cable backplane. So um, it's a new feature. Um, to the left of the buzz bar, there's now features to put in a data backplane um, for new developments in technology. Movable horizontal frame support. So this is the beam that I mentioned earlier. Um, this allows for um, the different uh, configurations that we, now, we are now seeing. Um, there's some equipment which is, say, a 5OU large equipment, and it's sometimes difficult to position correctly in the frame with certain inter integrations. So having the, boom, the beam movable within the frame allows for multiple um, avenues of integration of those bit large, large pieces of equipment. 
The other thing that's increased is the, the maximum load of this rack. So beforehand, the ORV2 was only able to hold the 1,400 kilos, uh, but now this is now increased to 1,600 kilos. Um, and this was required for the, the addition of, of the cooling manifolds and the other developments that are now going to be included in the ORV3 rack. And then finally at the bottom there, as I just mentioned, the cooling manifold support is new and, and the hex door support as well. So here's just a picture there of, of the list of tests that we have to do on the, each, in, on the rack during development. Um, some of the highlights of that is the shock and vibration testing, um, which is a standard test we've done for a long time, but that's something that we have to repeat. Um, transportation test, which is a real world transportation test where we put the rack on a truck with the loaded weight and we obviously review if, to check there's no damage made after that, that transportation test. Impact tests as part of the ASTM standard testing. Um, to replicate but shipping on sea, via sea or air. Um, some of those tests are quite um, uh, difficult to pass. So as you will see in some of the, the developments we had to make to get past them in a minute. And then finally, deployment tests. So this is the sort of test we do to replicate what the, the function of the rack in the data center. So that's rolling it to certain positions, you know, sometimes having to go through an elevator, um, when it has to go over a gap, you know, all those sorts of scenarios are tested in, the, in this testing uh, plan here. So one of the, the initial test developments that we made um, was from the, was on to the front vertical update. So um, on the cross-sectional plan there of the rack, you can see at the very front, um, highlighted there on the left is the front vertical member. So beforehand on V2, that was all one piece. Now we've separated, split it so that you can actually have the cable manager, the modular cable manager that I talked about earlier. And what we found on the front impact test was that the front vertical actually deformed. So um, this is something that we had to address and we addressed that by changing the steel from DC01, which is the standard steel, up to S355 to have a higher yield strength. We also increased the thickness of the material from two to 2.5 millimeters. And then we also increase the depth of the cross-section area to increase stiffness as well. So it just shows you how difficult these tests can be to pass because of the, the amount of force that's generated, especially with the increased load of 1,600 kilos. So um, this is one of the updates we had to make. So another update we made was to the cable manager. So when the, the front verticals um, actually deformed during testing, the cable manager also um, deformed. Um, and there was also then concerns that the amount of weight from the cables that would be fitted to the cable manager would actually see some deformation of the cable manager. So a couple of the updates we made for that, we added fixing points to the cable manager, but initially we had fixing points at the top and the bottom, but we added fixing points to the, to the rear, to the middle vertical member in the center to help with the stiffness there. And we also introduced um, a tag and slot feature at the top and the bottom of the cable manager, um, which also prevents that from swinging as well. So it locks that cable manager in there and, and it helps with assemblability of reducing the amount of screws there. Another update we had to make um, on the initial design of the beam, when we tested that, we actually seen failures um, at the weld sites on the left hand and the right hand side of the beam as it sits in the frame. Um, there's a, that is one of the biggest challenges with, with the rack when you're doing um, some of the impact tests. You tend to see um, what, uh, the bowing of the frame at the center. And so it's really important that the middle beam holds that rack in place. And when we did the initial tests, we seen deformation in that beam. So this is what we introduced. We added a clamp plate. So as well as the welded beam being in place, there was an assembled plate that goes into both slots underneath into the vertical member and it locks it in place. So that, that was one of the updates we did to address that issue. So another issue we had was um, during testing was the deployment tests that I mentioned earlier with the rolling test and the what they call the one inch gap test which is rolling the rack over the one inch gap and it makes quite a loud noise you can imagine with 1600 kilos. And the, so we, we were initially testing the ORV2 caster. So we know that that one's been fine for the 1,400 kilos, but obviously going up to the 1,600 kilos was a, a whole other kettle of fish. So one of the updates we had to make is introduce this new twin wheel caster. Um, and this, some of the features they added to this was obviously the twin wheels that helped with maneuverability. They also added a wheel bearing. Um, this is the bearing um, which was within the, the wheels itself, and that, that helped with the, the rolling test, so it helped with durability during the rolling test, 
the rolling test we have to do is an 800 meter long rolling test. And that, that was where we see any real issues with the other caster and, and this bearing improvement addressed that. The other thing that they update, updated was the main structure. So that was the main horn and the large bearing um, diameter in, in the actual caster assembly itself. And this, this helped with the one inch gap test because there's quite a lot of impact there and we actually seen deformation in the horn. And so that update def addresses that. So another update, um, this is more rack improvements. So this was um, related to testing, but more to do with usability. Um, the leveling foot test that we have to complete for this rack is, is quite, um, quite a challenging test. Um, we have to raise each leveling foot to its maximum height, one by one until the rack is fully standing. And as you can imagine, the rack does lean quite a large amount. Um, and the amount of weight that's put through these individual small pieces is, 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 is a lot. So, um, what we actually seen during testing is, is the plate that you can see there highlighted in the image to the left, um, that deformed. And because of the deformation, we, we increased the thickness from 2.5 mil to 3 mil, and also um, increased the uh, steel from DC01 to S355. So, and if you're wondering why the plate feature is there, on a previous presentation we, I, I presented here at OCP, um, that plate is actually there um, as a removable plate and it allows to remove the leveling foot if it's ever damaged um, in, in the data center and then be replaced easily. Because in the past, we had had issues where if a leveling foot got damaged, sometimes it was a scrapped rack. So hopefully, this solution will, will definitely solve that. So here are the rack improvements. Um, we had the manifold interface updates. So we have the upper brackets and the lower brackets for the manifold, as you can see here um, on the cross section of the rack. Um, these brackets are assemblable, so we didn't want to hinder the cost of the rack by having these features um, fixed in the canopy in the base tray. So by having this as assemblable features, um, you, you don't hinder the cost of the overall rack and you can just apply the kit when needed for the cooling manifold style racks. Um, and this has been being developed with the cooling manifold people, um, suppliers in mind, and we're working with them to, to introduce these kits. So here is just... Um, some images of some of the FEA analysis that we've done for the cooling manifold FEA. Um, the one supplier that we work with, and there's two slides. I've one, this is one supplier and I've got another supplier next. But um, this is the analysis we did. Um, some of the images there look quite um, scary with how much it's bent, but um, that's been scaled up um, massively just so that we can visibly see the kind of displacement that, that's seen during the, the forces applied in the cooling manifold. Um, so for, for us, the target displacement was one millimeter. So we wanted no, nothing more than one millimeter to ensure that those, those connection points are, are, are fixed for the cooling. Um, and as you can see, um, the upper displacement was only 0.67 and the lower 0.68. So that was within the boundaries and we were able to progress um, after that analysis was complete. So this is supplier two. Um, as you can see, some slightly st um, different data points there, but again, it, it was a pass. Um, and some of just, this is just an example of some of the work that we, we, we do for not just our, obviously our own rack, but things going into the rack. So part of the spirit of OCP is, is you know, working as a team with all these um, different technologies. And then this is the support we, we've been providing for development of the rack overall. So here is um, some topics of, about the airflow management. Um, so here you can see um, a seal on the left-hand side of the rack. Um, if anyone's familiar with ORV2, you will know that there's um, these same seals on that rack. Um, the difference with ORV3 and ORV2 is there's much more open edges of the sheet metal on ORV2, which is the perfect place and opportunity to put seals on that are fixed to those locations. With ORV3, it, it's much more, the design is much more closed with less edges to actually put seals on. And that's why, as you can see here, we, we've, we've fixed it to the very front. Um, this is actually still in development because there are some issues with the seal um, sliding to the left and the right, which isn't ideal. So it, it is under review and we are working through it, but um, it's definitely more of a challenge than RV2. Um, and here's just some images of the um, hot oil containment baffles. Um, again, very, this is very similar to ORV2. Um, there's no reason to change what was, what was previously there. So the, these designs are very similar. Um, and, and if you're familiar, the, there's some on the racks over at the Rittal stand if you wanted to take a look. So here is um, a slide on the brace beam development. 
As you can see, um, this is just some examples of where the beam can be moved to within the rack, either in the middle, um, plus or minus 5OU up and down from the center. So the, we obviously couldn't have it completely anywhere in the rack, because if you had it at the very top, you don't get any kind of support in the middle, and it would risk failures in the testing. So there's a, there's a window of 5OU there in the center, up and down, which we've got fixing points for that beam to allow for the configurations to change within the rack. So here is some analysis that we've done um, with, the, with no beam in the rack. So there also is the, the, the need for some solutions that don't have any beam, but obviously that will be limited by the amount of load that could be put in that rack without seeing deformation. And here is just some analysis that has been done um, through FBA, um, knowing the displacement of data may, and, and just so you know, data may of, of in the de is the depth of the rack, and that's from the buzz bar to the, the interfacing clip edges at the front of the frame. So as you can see here, when there is no beam in the rack, you've got iterations of load at each color. So red, 1,400 kilos, gray, 1,200, and then the bottom two there as well. And as you can see, it slightly improves with less load, but, but not by much. So it shows you how much impact the amount of load has on the overall form of the frame. Um, and this is the stuff that we will be testing as well. We haven't got to the testing yet, but we will be doing no beam testing on the frame. And then just finally on the recent test results, so all of the updates that I just ran through, um, they were all um, put in place. We, we created the prototype and we've just gone through iterations of testing. And as you can see, we passed the major testings um, that, that we failed on. The front impact test with the front vertical passed, so those changes were worked. The caster test um, of the rolling deployment tests, that worked as well, and we passed that test. Middle beam test was great. We didn't have any deformation of the beam. Shock and vibe pass was no problem, and the same for the transportation test. Also on the leveling foot with the plate change, with the increase in thickness and the DCO1 to S355, that also passed as well. So it shows you the, the developments that we're responding with um, for the testing are, are coming, to, coming through with a pass, which is great for the project and, and the cadence of the development of the rack. So if you wanted any more information about the, the rack and the specs that's involved with development of that rack, you could go to this link and you can see what we're designing around. Um, has anyone got any questions about any of those developments? What do you feel your timeline is for the closure of So the specification itself, um, I, I, could, I can comment on the development of the rack. I believe the development and launch of the rack is looking to be the end of next year. Um, from a spec lock point of view, I believe we're, we would be looking at the beginning of, of, of next year sometime. Um, but I think the, the, the timeline of freeze for the rack for launch may be slightly different to the lock of the spec, um, which maybe Steve can talk to it um, a bit later, but um, I think the release of the spec might be later than the launch of the rack. Um, do, do you know the, oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> Pardon me. So from a, from, a, from a spec standpoint, we were hoping to integrate a lot of the changes that we're learning about right now. Um, and then have another publication uh, early next year and then maybe send it for finalization towards the end of next year. So there is uh, some uh, public versions of it that are available right now so you can see kind of where we're at and we'll continue to kind of update the, the what's uh, available out on the website as we as we learn more. Yeah, thanks Steve, sorry to rope you in there. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Hello. Oh, thank you. you did Took one of the big change in V3 is a 48 volt support. Yep. Okay. Are you going also to regulate the output of the battery to make it a regulated 48 volt coming to all of the ITs, or are you gonna keep it range 40 to 60? Uh, so I can I can help with that. So the <laughs> next thing we've got up here is all the power updates. So it'll have all the details on that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh oh. <laughs> how, how do you determine the pass-fail limits for your DVT tests? The pass element. The pass and fail limits. So Criteria. You test, you know, this is a pass, this is a fail. How do you, like for example, you had one millimeter acceptable deformation. Um, how do you know that's acceptable? 
Right, so the, there's, a, there's, a num, there's a lot of TA analysis rework um, that's been, been done in the background. Um, and depending on the current failure criteria, be it disconnection from the power shelf or delatching at the front of, so the equipment, one of the biggest risks is the equipment delatching at the front of the frame. And within the tolerance bands that are defined in the TA analysis that we're doing, um, we would then define the pass or fail criteria for the rack. So we would know, for example, if, if you get more than a, you know, a two millimeter bow on the frame as it opens wide, we would know that those clips would disengage and the, the equipment would slide out. So depending on those, the TA analysis and the outcomes of them um, and the failure criteria that kind of given to us from Facebook and the other customers, um, we then define those d dimensions and the test criteria around that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's all very integrated between the definition of the IT gear that goes in there, um, which also ripples through the power shelf design, the connector design, the bus bar. So we end up with budgets for all those components, and everybody gets their budget, and they have to stay within their budget. That way, the entire system works together when you put disparate uh, components together. Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Cheers.